Thank you, Laverne. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today we have an exciting program that's really quite different from the way we've ever done this before. And I've been attending these for now 15 years. A virtual discussion with two extraordinary human beings. Uh, Dr. Bernice King, the youngest daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. A powerful voice uh, in America today, a leader in civil and human rights, and a friend. We're delighted to welcome her to this conversation. And also in this conversation is Ambassador Andrew Young. Uh, we refer to him in Atlanta as Ambassador Young, but he's also been our mayor. He's been our congressman. And as Bernice well knows, uh, he was a lieutenant of Dr. King throughout his ministry uh, in the 1960s and was by his side when he died in Memphis in 1968. Um, our theme today is our rising voices a call for bold social action. And I can't think of two human beings whose powerful voices and insights will be so important to helping us understand how we will come to terms with this theme and the challenges that we face today. We're taping uh, this discussion in December, in the final days of 2020. Uh, the conversation will be streamed as it is being streamed now on January 18th, which would be the 92nd birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. This has been a celebration which uh, we've had in Minneapolis for 31 years. Uh, in two days, uh, we will inaugurate the 46th President of the United States, Joseph Biden. And his vice president will be Kamala Harris, the first woman, the first South Asian woman, the first black woman to serve as vice president of the United States. In one sense, this is a period I would suspect of great optimism for many, but 2020 has been a period of extraordinary challenges two twin pandemics, COVID, a disease which has ravaged black and brown communities and exacerbated the gaps and divides, the inequalities of our country and raised them up uh, for all of us to see. And anti-black racism, which we've seen in the police violence and the white supremacist violence, which left Ahmaud Arbery dead in Georgia, which led Breonna Taylor dead in Kentucky and George Floyd dead in Minneapolis. Um, a year of extraordinary twin pandemics. So in that context, we embrace this theme of our rising voices, a call for bold social action and I'd ask my two guests, Bernice and Andy, to share with us their observations on 2020 and the challenges we face in 2021. Bernice? So, you know, Michael, uh, thank you, first, first of all, um, and the UNCF uh, for this opportunity. Um, obviously, this has been a, uh, a very, redefining year uh, for our world. Um, when the pandemic hit, I think there were so many people uh, who were hoping that it would be over quickly and it extended. I tend to look at things out of a spiritual eye. Um, so I wanna come from that perspective. Um, I believe uh, this is the universal for me, God's way of sitting us down, uh, quieting us, so that we would really begin to connect to our humanity um, and to 
think about the ways in which we have been conducting ourselves uh, as citizens of this world in various sectors. Uh, you know, we have been moving rapidly in the direction of expanding this enormous wealth gap. Um, and the greater the expansion of the wealth gap, I believe uh, the more intense the violence will be. Um, we were moving dangerously uh, close uh, to being so polarized uh, that we were going to end up in a very uncivilized state. Uh, and so this, this pandemic, I'm hoping, has afforded people an opportunity to do what my father called for in 1967 when he wrote his book, Where Do We Go From the Accounts Community? And he spoke about it as well which is the need for a revolution of values, um, a reordering of priorities, uh, where people are now at the center and not things and materialism. For me, it's been a time of reassessing and, and uh, you know, I've tried to, to follow those important values in my life, but more importantly, to redouble my efforts through the King Center I serve as the CEO of the King Center organization that my my mother founded uh, two and a half months after my father died uh, as the official live memorial to the life, work, and legacy of my father. And our efforts to really educate and train people in this nonviolent way of living that to me is the only way to create a more just, humane, peaceful, and equitable um, world. So I'll stop there because I've said a, a lot and Ambassador Young. Well, you, but you said a lot. So keep, us, keep us going. Andy, you got to follow Bernice. Uh, you know, well, I can go back because the first speech I ever gave on a national scene, Minneapolis, and her father was in jail in uh, Birmingham and Constance Baker Motley was his attorney. Uh, Connie Motley was scheduled to speak at uh, a, one of the big, either NAACP or HBCU, there was some, but it was the biggest dinner in Minneapolis, uh, $25 a person in 1963. Wow. See? And then her daddy, Dr. King was scheduled to speak the next night in Detroit, and he's in jail. And she says, I can't leave him in jail, and I can't leave town. I said, well, you want me to call and tell them to find a substitute? And they said, no, you go. <laughs> and I said, so I showed up, and it was actually my first and I, I'm grateful to Minneapolis because they didn't boo me when I came, which I expected. Uh, they listened to me tell the story of what was going on in Birmingham. And then the next night in Detroit, the importance of the institutions that we've been taking for granted. I don't know uh, in the audience there, but I, I, I bet a healthy percentage of them uh especially the leaders. I uh, had an experience in uh, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, our vice president, I'm very proud to say, is uh, a graduate of Howard University. Th this June, I will be 70 years out of college. Mm. I graduated in 1951, and I knew nothing when I went there. I didn't learn that much there, but Somehow they made me the man. They made me whatever man I have become. Uh, and uh, we need to define that process of what, what is it that HBCUs do to us? So what is it that education does to us? And I am very proud uh, of the way the business community has come forward. Uh, Citigroup uh, did a study of what's wrong with America, the economy, 
And they came to the conclusion that discrimination costs the economy $16.5 trillion since 2000 to 2020. That's almost a trillion dollars a year that would be changed if women were paid the same as men, if minorities were not discriminated against uh, in good, better paying jobs. Uh, and if it was really done fairly, uh, but I, I've been shocked that uh, almost every made financial institution has made at least an intellectual commitment uh, to put a financial dent in the in in, in the problems of the economy and in the poverty that um, we gave 1.7 trillion dollar uh, tax break to the people in the top two percent and it had very little impact on the rest of us and what we're saying is let's stand up together uh, and reorganize the relationship between us uh, so that we can have a beloved community. We can live together as brothers and sisters, and we can care for each other. And and continuing the ministry. And, you know, one of the elements that I always think about with Mrs. King is that, you know, she was graceful and gracious, but she was also determined and persistent. And uh, and I, what is what what can we do? Because we can tell people they must be different, that they should be different. But how do we get them to be different? You know, um, I was sitting in a room with a gentleman uh, who works in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and he was talking about how all these studies have been done. You know, around. Um, you know, the, the traditional way of doing equity and inclusion, you know, through having, you know, all of these different trainings, et cetera, and, and trying to educate people, this kind of cognitive approach. He said, but what we're discovering is that it takes an experience for people to recalibrate. Um, and the reason I said that is, you know, my father said men hate each other and that men is universal for the women that are listening. Um, uh, and it was the language of the time, but men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other and they don't communicate with each other because they're separate from each other. I really think when we talk about bold action, you know, nonviolence, one of the first principles, nonviolence is a courageous way of life. It's going to take some bold actions and courage to come out of our comfort zones and our silos to really cross some lines and barriers to experience each other. Um, because until we do that, we're going to continue to divide. We're going to continue to separate. Um, we're we're going to continue uh, the, the rhetoric and the propaganda of fear. Uh, so I, I think it's really going to take uh, some of that, you know, everybody that I know of, they, we sing to our choir. <clears throat> um, and when we talk about inclusion, I just want to say this. Inclusion means literally people who do not think like you. Um, it's not like-minded. <laughs> and every time we do it, we, we, cause the danger of inclusion is, especially in the current climate is as we move forward and we have to address these systemic racial issues and we've got to make sure there's equity. Um, but the danger as we move forward is that we do it in such a way that we forget in inclusion. That even means the white male. Now it doesn't mean that you may not have to make some fundamental changes. Yes, the boardrooms in America must change. There are too many white men in charge in America making major decisions and corporate America heavily influences Washington where our policies come from that affect our day-to-day -day, um, 
social engagement, our livelihoods, everything. You know, today, all the progress that you talk about, we've, we, we've seen continued growth and development in Atlanta. You see continued growth and development in Minneapolis. But we leave a lot of people behind. Yep. And we also, we also see an emerging racial, I, I want to say, I mean, it's, it's almost like, how did we get back to this kind of white supremacy? How did we get back into demonizing black people? Uh, so I, I, I want to ask Bernice, what is, what's different about today that is going to make the solve different? I, I think it's, it's in the theme. It, it, the theme, a call for bold social action. Um, I had an opportunity uh, yesterday to participate in a press conference between the National Black Bank Foundation and fund uh, with the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, a member, uh, two members of my leadership Atlanta class, a black gentleman and a white gentleman, um, were uh, together in a march during the, the whole Ahmaud Arbery thing. Or well, it may have been George Floyd. And they got together and said, you know, how can we really make a dent on the racial wealth gap? Uh, a black gentleman and a white gentleman. Um, and through their conversation, they came up with this concept of creating kind of sort of an umbrella to position black banks to be able to uh, bring their uh, collective uh, resources together so that they can loan, uh, make greater loans. Because uh, you know there's a limit to the n number of loans that most black banks can make. What mm -hmm. this did was it enabled people like the Atlanta Hawks to do good business with good banks. Um, because it was a bold action that a black man and a white man came together. And now you have the Atlanta Hawks doing business with a black bank. We, if, if we're going to change that wealth gap, home ownership is important. We lost, the African-American community lost a lot of wealth um, in 2008 with the mortgage crisis. Uh, and, you know, if you don't have the leverage of home ownership, you, know, you, can't, you can't progress that far. And so uh, this, this bold action where the black banks have now decided to work together under this umbrella uh, is so critical. That's a bold act, social action that's going to that change the dynamics. What I'm hearing from both of you is a combination. Part of it is, as you say, bold social action. It's institutional change. But it's also deeply personal change. I mean, that it's got to begin in your home. It's got to begin in your dealings with your neighbor. And with individuals, so it's 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 a it's a combat. It's not one or the other. It's both. Is is that a is that a lesson we learned from Dr. King and from your mother and from uh, the civil rights movement? Is you know, we we do forget that that did involve individuals making changes in their own lives and becoming a part of a, a movement that was designed to to build a different neighborhood to know people differently. Andy. But that's what nonviolence was all about. Uh, and that's why we called it direct action. We didn't wait for the Congress. We didn't wait for, because the business community is sensitive to a three to 5% drop in part in, in profits. Uh, it takes 50 to 60% to get the Congress to pay any attention uh, to change. And so the business community, I think, as Bernice was just saying, that, that this is where what we're doing in Atlanta, in Atlanta and Georgia is important in the election, but it's still going to be, it's going to happen quicker uh, in the business community. And because it's good business. Now we can call it racial injustice and it is, but it's also, as Dr. King said, it's race, war, and poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and all of those things conspire 
uh, to create evil lives. This is so powerful. I want to take us back to where we began this conversation, Bernice, with you saying there had to be a spiritual change. I think one of the voices we don't hear enough of is the voice of your mother, Coretta Scott King, as we talk about the legacy of Martin Luther King. And I, and we don't talk enough, I think, about the Center for Nonviolent Social Change. People often think of nonviolence as a sort of pacifism. A, you know, a, and so I, I think what Andy's saying is we've got to change people deep inside. You've said we've got to change people deep inside. Is there, and we have to, and you're also saying we have to think about nonviolence differently. That was your mother's, I mean, she worked so hard to build that center. And she believed so deeply in nonviolent social change. How, is that a spiritual change? Is it a powerful change? How is that, how, how might that tool be brought to use in the 21st century? Well, first of all, people have to be open to going through the education and training. Um, it doesn't just happen uh, just because somebody says it. Uh, a, a cadre of people have to be willing to do that. And I'm constantly encouraging people um, to connect with us and in, in the training that we do because we heavily focus on the philo philosophical side connected with the strategic side, meaning the principles of nonviolence and the steps. Because if you follow the steps without the principles, then you might get some change, but you're not gonna get the permanent change that's needed, the sustainable change, because the principles are what keep us focused on creating the beloved community. Because in the end, the dignity of the personhood is important. You don't attack people, you don't destroy people, you stay focused on the issue. You don't try to defeat the people. Um, at the end of the day, you're trying to find a win-win pathway and win people over instead of win over them. And so when I think about nonviolence, we have a definition at the King Center that says that it is a love-centered way of thinking, speaking, and acting that leads to personal, cultural, and social transformation. Um, and, and that's where the spirituality is. When we ever tap into the true power of love, you know, daddy talks about the connection between justice and love, you know, uh, that, that just uh, uh, love is implementing the demands of justice is what he said. And that true power, meaning those people who have positions of power and influence in different spaces. And so, yes, it's, it's, it's deeply spiritual in the sense that it's internal first before it expresses itself externally, but it's also practical. You know, Uncle Andy talked about the practicality of it, that at the end of the day, if we're gonna make change in this day, I've been saying it since 2000, we have entered into the era of corporate social responsibility. We're 20 years into that now, and it probably wasn't until, a, you know, maybe around 2005-10, where corporations really woke up and understood their incredible social responsibility. But just as daddy had to help President Johnson, President Kennedy, um, to move in the direction of getting vote, uh, uh, Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act, those of us that are citizens of these United States have to help corporate America uh, to move in the right direction to use their enormous power and influence to bring these changes to bear. And I think there needs to be a, a demand made on corporations to adopt a social justice agenda. Andy, but that's you know, a powerful call to action. You got to step in here and tell us something else. It's good business. There's got to be somebody in with a business sense to realize that diversity is good business. You know, I think that um, I was trying to think uh, because we are coming to a close. Whether there was a final statement? Can I? Can you I know? have one more thing? No, you go right ahead. I'm. Well, you gonna close no, this out? Let me have one more thing because I've I've been picking on. Um, well, I've been picking on myself. My wife was from and and Mrs. King Coretta King went to the same high school in Marion, Alabama. And Jean used to tell me. Let me tell you something. If you and Martin 
had married any of those girls you were going with in college, nobody, <laughs> nobody would have ever heard your name. <laughs> There's nothing humble about the black preachers of that generation. Uh, and they were men of power and they were men of intelligence, but it was the women that pushed the spirituality and the education. This is a total national, international, global spiritual opportunity. It's, it's in here. I mean, the answers are not so much always here. They're usually in here. And in whatever conflict you have, uh, my Bible says the kingdom of God is within you. And instead of scheming, well, as I said, my people who are called by my name, if they humble themselves and pray, then they will hear from heaven and I will heal their land and heal their lives. Thank you, Andy. Bernice, will you close this out? I, I just want to make the statement that my mother did make. She said, uh, women, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, you must become its soul. And um, I'm delighted. Say that again. That. Say, say, say that again, <laughs> Say that real soul. <laughs> women, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, I believe you must become its soul. I'm just, I'm delighted and elated that our nation now has a woman, um, at, uh, you know, that will be serving um, as the uh, vice president. Um, I think it's going to continue to move us in the direction that we need to go as a nation and the world, because we do have to save the soul of America. Um, and, uh, there is something, and, and I don't want to be biased in this, but I am going to be in, in closing. I have noticed in all of the different groupings of people that Black women in particular are very inclusive. If you look at any uh, struggle, if you look at any cause, if you look at anything that that black women typically, and there are exceptions obviously to every rule, um, have been um, the head of or a part of, we bring everybody to the table and in the room. And so I think we're gonna see um, some powerful things. And yes, we have to put the necessary pressure on the administration as we do with any administration. Um, but this is, I said it in 2010, this is the century of the woman. And uh, if we can get more women in corporate America and CEO positions, um, it would be incredible uh, because we do need to have a balance in this nation. Um, and the restoration of our soul is at stake. Well, I want to thank you, Bernice, Bernice King, Dr. Bernice King. I want to thank you, Ambassador Andrew Young, for what has been one of the most incredible conversations I've been honored to participate in. Thank you. Thank you for your brilliance, your insight, and your generosity in sharing. Uh, this has been wonderful, and I hope that our listeners, our viewers, will be inspired, moved, and called to action by the words they've heard here today. Because our rising voices, a call for bold social action has been articulated in this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.